Um, I'm Dr. Douglas Gwynn. I am the director of the Office of Residence Life and Housing. Mm -hmm. All right, so my first question is, why must students be financially cleared before receiving their housing? Um, I think first that it's important to understand that housing and tuition fees, room and board are at this institution are all one package. Mm -hmm. So what we, this department in particular, have been challenged with is the point where we get to having the unfortunate process to ask students to leave because they haven't been financially clear. And so it has been my position for a number of years that we work with students in advance of them coming to the institution as well as receiving a housing assignment in terms of their registration, their financial clearance to cover the cost of tuition, fees, room and board. Because from where I sit, um, it's, it's, it's a challenging situation when we have to ask a student to, uh, to leave because they unfortunately cannot afford to cover the cost of full attendance. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm sorry. My next question is, um, why does Morgan endure a student housing crisis almost every year, and what is the university doing currently to combat that issue? So, first, as I always say, and, and I'll use an example, I, I was speaking to a parent mm -hmm. um, this summer, spring, I mean fall, um, whose son was in the hotel. And unfortunately, he applied for housing late. And so as I'm applying for housing late, he was placed on the wait list. Mm -hmm. And then the institution, um, in support of all students who are interested in coming to Morgan, engaged the hotel. Um, and the mother was fairly upset because her son was in the hotel. But I had a reminder that unfortunately, it first starts with the date that you apply for housing. And there are other circumstances and things of that, and I understand that applies to that, but that's where we were in that moment. And so in an effort to support all students who are interested in coming to housing, I mean, coming to Morgan, we, we engage in these alternative housing options to support the demand. Now, the demand for housing for Morgan has been incredible. Morgan is number one in a lot of areas and a lot of arenas in terms of their enrollment. And in addition to that, Morgan is interested in supporting those students who want to come to a historically black college or university, i.e. Morgan State University as being one of the premier institutions. Um, it is not a pre preferable situation, uh, particularly as it relates to what I do. Um, it's not preferable, but the alternative to that is that a student would not be able to come to Morgan. And so we support our students as best we can um, with these um, housing options that may not be ideal initially, but they do support the student's ability to come to Morgan and begin their matriculation. So just a quick follow-up question. It's okay if you don't know because it involves like numbers and mm -hmm. all that statistics and stuff. So um, would you say that the um, number of rooms that Morgan has, excluding the hotel, which means like all on-campus buildings, um, mm -hmm. let's just say mm -hmm. for freshmen that are coming in, mm -hmm. um, is equal to the amount of students that, students that enroll in Morgan every year? So just the freshman class. So, so know that the discussions are made well in advance of the application season in terms of what the anticipated enrollment is going to be. Mm -hmm. And then that is gauged against our housing spaces that we have. And again, I often tell individuals you have to think about it from a new student and returning student type perspective. And so the institution then seeks to, based upon the projection, ensure if we need additional housing to meet that demand. Um, again, the popularity of Morgan State University has been so great 
that even the projections have been exceeded. And so we then have the quandary of, do we not say to a student, you can't come to Morgan? Or do we provide a space for that student so that we can, you know, so they can begin their matriculation? Um, so if the, if to your point, the number of students does exceed our housing capacity, but that's where we enter into a situation like a hotel, again, to provide those students with, you know, with housing. Mm -hmm. um, the university is currently engaging in a very extensive um, residential expansion program. Um, it's a seven year program. Um, the new Thurgood Marshall is an example of that program the additional 600 bed facility, 604 bed facility that's currently being erected next to it is an, exa is, is an example of that phase. We have engaged in a full renovation of what we call our, our legacy residence halls, like for example, Baldwin and Cummings, um, Harper Tubman, and there is also projected now within that plan is that O'Connell Hall will be raised and an additional five to 600 bed facility will be built there. Now, it takes time to build the building. And so with the, if, if, if enrollment and projections continue to go as they have been, we are going to be kind of always behind the eight ball, but then it's up to us to determine what number of spaces we need to, you know, we need to secure to support particularly returning students in that case, and then i.e. if we need additional hotel space moving forward. Okay. Um, okay. On to my next question, which we were talking about before. Um, students have expressed that the Office of res Residence Life and Housing, excuse me, is hard to get in contact with. Why is this and what is um, the Office of Residence Life and Housing doing to combat this issue? Okay, so again, a lot of the things that happen in this process in terms of being admitted, um, getting classes and housing is part of part of all that. And it's kind of like at the end of that whole cycle. Right. Um, it has a lot to do with um, processes in terms of students following the process. Right. Mm -hmm. Applying for housing early um, so that, you know, we can know when we may need to cut off housing, start a wait list, and then make other decisions in terms of how we're going to support our students in terms of their housing. Um, as the enrollment has increased exponentially, we have put additional individuals on our phones, on our emails. Um, uh, I, you know, my admin can tell you that I am, again, like I was speaking to you earlier, inundated in that period and the truth of the matter kind of rests upon our ability to um, meet that volume and so we have put in place a number of things to support our ability to respond um, part of it is communication in that for example we have sought to be completely transparent as well as exemplify what the processes are in order to, you know, obtain housing to secure your housing space. Unfortunately, there becomes at times repeat questions for us in terms of things that are simply, if you went online or you looked at it in the system, you would know, know the answer to. And then in addition to that, um, we get a lot of repeat emails and phone calls when a certain situation did not work out the way that a student anticipated it to work out. And so then it's um, the students being persistent and trying to get a different answer, and this to be honest, than what they've gotten. Um, an example of that would be we clearly advertise that um, roommate selection would not be part of this year. Um, but we were inundated with calls because individuals wanted 
a particular roommate. Mm. And for this year, unfortunately, that was not possible and would have really impacted the timeliness of us getting out assignments and completing the process with individuals, you know, wanting to be roommates. And that's just one example that happens that kind of creates this repeat questions that we that we are constantly getting. So if 35 or 45 percent of the questions are first time questions and things of that nature, and then the rest of them are kind of like repeat questions or information that's already that we've posted, that we put out on social media and things of that nature, it's kind of like a perfect storm in some ways. And also we have the call center, we have other other entities and other offices that that you know that are called and 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 try to facilitate you know all the numbers of calls and things of that nature that we're getting okay just a quick follow-up question um i know the housing application usually opens towards the end of um, every school year so after the housing application opens well i guess that's the first step of the process when does the office of residence life and housing begin their process with um, putting people in rooms and um well not roommate selection but just organizing everyone and figuring out where they need to go well the application generally opens in march Mm -hmm. right and this year it was march the 16th and as an example um, within an hour of our application being open, we received over 500 requests for housing. Mm-hmm. And that was within the first hour. And then it just went up exponentially from there. So the process is that the student applies. Um, and as an example, this year, in terms of our efforts to simplify and explain the process, when a student went into the system, right, the student can then only see those housing options that they are eligible to to reside in. For example, a freshman cannot see the altars, mm-hmm. right? So a freshman, um, male or female, would be able to see, you know, Harper Tubman and all those types of of, of uh, selections. Um, then it showed you a diagram of that selection and the associated cost mm-hmm. with that with that uh with that housing selection that you made. So again to the previous question that you asked me, an example of that is some students made those selections and then unfortunately were not able to afford the selection that they made. And then that became a call after a call after a call after a call. Because we tried to provide the exact diagram and the exact cost so that students and parents can then make their necessary financial calculations to see if that's actually, before they make their final selection, something that they can afford or where they want to live and where they want to be. So when that happens, generally by July 1st, we're beginning to send out um, those assignments to students. Now this year, we initially attempted to support students by getting them financially cleared, fully registered, and ensure that they had met all of our COVID um, requirements for the institution. So that when we get to this part of the season, this academic year, we don't have our students worrying about if they're financially cleared, worrying about their registration, and all those kinds of nature. So we can, can, so we can in this office, because I always say that housing is really a small part of what we do, we're more interested in our student engagement and student development and those types of things. But um, as, it, as it has happened, you know, we had an inordinate number of students and some of the adjustments were made regarding that to, to the extent that unfortunately now we're about to hit our drop period, mm-hmm. which is not a favorite period for us. Um, and so part of that was to try to circumvent that and prevent that from happening and support our students so that we they can get about, get on with the with the point of matriculation and we can get about student development, student engagement and supporting our students. So the process is fairly is, is fairly that simple. You apply uh, roughly by July 1. <clears throat> um, we are sending out those assignments and um, and we're making those assignments, you know, as quickly as we can as they come in. 
And in this case, for this year, in the beginning, as they clear, um, again, we relax that and move forward with just providing students with assignments. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this question um, just because you answered it previously, but just to let you know, it was, um, why does information like moving dates and room assignments come out late, specifically one to two weeks before school starts, but you answered that. Um, and and I want to make sure that I was clear on that. Mm -hmm. um, why they may come out late is because one of the reasons is that we're securing additional space. Mm -hmm. And then also, it does require um, a balancing of gender. For example, um, women matriculating at Morgan, particularly as it relates to the freshman class, outnumber men three to one. Mm -hmm. And so the greater amount of space is need for women. So for example, for the last two years, we converted Baldwin and Cummings from male to female. Mm -hmm. And so some of those things are part of the whole process to support everyone being able to get a space as, we, as best we can uh, here at Morgan. And additionally, for this year, and this year only, initially, as I stated, mm -hmm. the process was the clearing aspect. And so a number of students did not clear prior to the end of the middle or the end of July, and even, again, the first week of August. So that's why some of those assignments didn't go out to that time. Now, those students who were already in the pipeline, who had applied, who were financially cleared, who were full-time registered, who had met the COVID, July 1st, we started sending out their their um, their notifications. Okay. Um, so my next question is, and we kind of touched on this previously, um, but why are students, specifically upperclassmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, um, living in campus housing? Um, so that means like on-campus bu um, buildings in Morgan and Marble Hall, excuse me, allowed to are not allowed to pick or guarantee their roommate. So this year was the first year that we didn't allow mm -hmm. the um, the roommate um, selection process. Um, first, I'll start with some of the changes that were made. This year, um, the cost of different housing options, like a suite, an apartment, and things of that nature, the um, was differentiated. Whereas before, for example, on campus proper, wherever you live, it was the same price, mm -hmm. right? So, but we had the new Thurgood Marshall coming on, which was a totally different price, which is, you know, you look at Thurgood, I'm sorry, Marble Hall Gardens and HH Midtown, as well as um, Towson Town Place and Altus, they're different pricing structures, right? And so some of the challenges that that first being the point because for the first time we had different pricing structures the other point is um we often were challenged with students following the process of roommate selection so i may go in right because the way we had the system set up is i would go in and I wanted, I'm sorry, what's your name? Elijah. Elijah to be my roommate, right? And the system would allow me to send Elijah an email notification that I'm requesting him to be my roommate. So then Elijah had to respond to that via the system. And then they were exchanged pins so that the system knew that both individuals agreed to be roommates because we often find people who want somebody to be their roommate, but they, the person who they want doesn't, really doesn't want to be their roommate, right? And so sometimes where we had is that invitation was sent out, the pins were sent out, but one person in that party did not respond. But the other person didn't know that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so when we get to the end of the assignment process and you found out that that person wasn't your roommate, and they had not had that discussion that I'm really not interested in being your roommate, then that became a challenge. Then I may start my application process in March, right? But Elijah didn't start his until July 15th. Well, again, we've already started sending out assignments. And so the timing of matching that 
becomes almost impossible because we've moved forward with the process, but one person in, in, in that party did not follow the timeliness of the process. And so that was challenging for us to make those necessary matches. And so those are some of the things that we've experienced. And now you add the layer of a different pricing differential and having to clear and having to make sure you're registered and having to make sure that, you know, you've met all COVID requirements may not be a discussion that Elijah and I would, would be having and not knowing on either side what may have prevented that. And we are not in a position and nor will we have a conversation with a student and say, why didn't I get my roommate and then explain to them, well, Elijah may not have done this COVID. Elijah may not have registered. Elijah may not have enough money for this particular housing option. That's not a discussion that we're going to have. Mm -hmm. So for this year, we um, we didn't do the housing, the roommate matching for for that that re those reasons and some others. Okay. Um, uh, so this is the second to last question. Um, my next question is the what is the worst case scenario you yourself have seen in student housing? And can I ask how long you've worked at Morgan as the um, director of I've been the director since two thousand and four. Okay. Um I've seen a lot. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a lot. But honestly, I think my worst, and I think Ms. Gass has got to know what I'm going to say. Um, my worst situation happened this year when we unfortunately lost a student, and which is always challenging for us. Um, I get kind of choked up about it, thinking about it. Um, and we were going through the process of supporting the family. Um, they were actually on campus that day. We had provided counseling services and staff support to help the family pack up the student's room um, and things of that nature. And I had parents that come in whose son was in the hotel okay. and the first question to me was well I don't want my son in the hotel but again that individual hadn't applied for housing until August and notice I said August um, and they requested some special accommodations in the hotel which were kind of uh, un a bit unreasonable because everybody was assigned um, particularly with a roommate and they wanted a single room um, but more importantly, one of the room on campus, and I told them we are currently at capacity. And so it's also a process of when you apply, in all fairness, in terms of who we give assignments to when vacancies become available. And um, unfortunately, after the discourse was, well, well, why do you do this? Why do you, the hotel? And I said to the parents, I said, unfortunately, had Morgan, had we not made the decision to extend to a hotel, your son would not even be, we, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. And so it is a perspective of Morgan's commitment to supporting students having the ability to matriculate here. Um, the parent wasn't having that and then asked me, well, I know you have a room. And I said to the parent, excuse me, said, I know you have a room. And I said, I'm not, I'm not following you. Well, that son, that boy just passed away. He just died. So I know you have a room. So I think that that is probably my worst situation that I had to dealt, had to deal with because it was related to a student and a parent, mm -hmm. and. And, and that level of insensitivity has been something that, to that level, is, it, I had not ever experienced before. Mm -hmm. So that, I would say, is probably my worst day. That's understandable. Um, that was the, uh, 
the student that passed um, this year was that um, freshman week because mm. I know there was like some yeah, scores, but I never time. like personally heard anything else about it. Um, okay. Um, oh, thank you for that. And then we're on to our very last question. Um, okay. Yes. So recently, resident assistance from resident halls um, all over campus and some com- campus contracted buildings have went on strike due to no pay. Do you have a comment on the situation? And can you tell us is it, can you tell us, excuse me, if this is a recurring issue every year? Um, and what did the university do this year to solve that issue? So in my time um, in this space, that is something that we have never experienced before. Um, unfortunately, um, this department was challenged with the processing of uh, um, RA and uh, DA compensation, which was most unfortunate. Um, Our student staff um, expressed their displeasure, and rightfully so, and uh, the institution as a whole collectively, including Dr. Wilson and and, and Dr. Banks, came and met with the students to try to rectify the situation and provide some levels of mediation in terms of compensation until the matter could be rectified. So, the matter has been rectified in terms of, you know, their pay and their compensation, ensuring that we make sure that that doesn't happen again. Um, and we are, we have, as the president has directed, supported our students um, in that period, in that gap period. Um, we are monitoring our students to ensure their support in terms of the process of being financially cleared because um, what you may not know is some of the students use those funds to support their ability to cover the cost of attendance. Mm -hmm. So we are working with those students to ensure that they are supported in that. And um, to my understanding and with my discussions, um, we are back on track. Mm 